Uh, hey guys, welcome back to the Believe, Be Real, Be Bold podcast. I'm on location. I'm a guest in Dr. Jenny Schuyler's home today instead of her office. Yes. Thank you so very much for having me. My pleasure. I am so ecstatic to reconnect and uh, pick up where we left off in our conversation about polyamorous relationships in the back then. Yeah. And today uh, we were just like catching up, chit-chatting a little bit, and we were talking about um, communication in regards to sex. Yes. But remind me, what's happened since the last episode? You had a really busy summer. Yes. Is that all business or is that some no, per, some no, no. personal Pleasure. travel? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Do you want me to talk this way or just like? Oh, yeah, okay. you and me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no. Every weekend, I have not been in Boulder for like a single weekend all summer. Mm -hmm. But it's good. Mountain travel, mountain escaping, just like decompressing, mm -hmm. trying to decompress. Someone's in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the kids and the family were the focus of the summer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. But busy, like really busy. Very family oriented busy. Not all business. Actually, probably not a lot of business at all. Mm -hmm. Like at work. And then I leave it. Sure. It's awesome. How do you juggle everything because you're so busy? Um, well, that's Bowley in the kitchen who helped me with my kids. So that helps with my life. Um, and I keep a great calendar so that I literally have to like budget when I exercise mm -hmm. or maybe relax. Mm -hmm. I don't really relax. When do we make time for it? Oh my God. I, have to, I literally have to put it in my calendar and be like, these 15 minutes I'm going to relax. <laughs> and that's perfect. I'm that's do great. Nothing. Um, but I have an impeccable calendar. Mm -hmm. So I have my clients, I have my Adam and Eve work. I have the website, business, tax stuff behind the scenes, which I usually do after the kids go to bed. And then the weekends, I'm like, okay, it's kid time, so we're going to do lots of adventures or go to the mountains or pretend to decompress. Right. I live and die by my calendar as well. And there have been some double scheduling, double booking, you know. Um, I delegate most of my calendar responsibilities to my assistant now. Oh. And then the automated system too. Like, I'll send somebody a link and they just book via... Yeah. County. It's yeah. a great system. Oh, so yeah, you yeah. tell me that. Mm -hmm. I am a control freak with that. Like, I need to be in charge of my calendar. I don't have anything online for calendaring either. I like to know, like, these are my spots, mm -hmm. and I'll fill in the spots according to what's best. Mm -hmm. Like, if I don't fill in all my spots, I'd rather fill in the spots where I know my kids are in school, for instance. Sure. And then if I have to leak into their hours and they're not in school, like, both kids are in school right now, for instance. So this is a great time. Mm -hmm. Um... But nine would have been a, it was just hard, right? Because he sure. start, one starts school at nine. So it's like, mm -hmm. go, come home. Anyway, so yeah. I try to budget my time around like them and, you know, self-care. And if I have to leak into other hours, I do, but. Yeah, September is self-care month. Oh, it is? It is. Oh, I did see that on mm -hmm. Instagram. And. Um, what are you doing for self-care? Well, I'm reprioritizing jujitsu. Okay. Because, um. I had a shoulder injury and then I got sick. You might still be able to hear it in my throat a little bit. No. Uh, this shoulder injury is not detrimental. It's not terrible. It's actually getting better because uh, one of my clients was injured as well. He separated his shoulder um, sailing on Lake Dillon with his dad. Oh. So I, I saw him this morning for the first time in three weeks and he was telling me how he separated his shoulder. He actually ended up in Lake Dillon, fell off the boat for 10 minutes. And then he had to go to the ER and it was that bad. So I was able to take some time off and let my body recover um, through my own shoulder injury as well. Okay. So I've trained jujitsu twice this week since being sick. Um, actually, it's been the two best training days I've had since I joined Easton. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. Maybe because the break. The break and then my mindset and yeah, I've been doing a little, yeah, doing a little NLP work and hypnotherapy with one of our former guests. Oh, okay. It's so cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So like the mindset is clear and my vision and my purpose is realigned uh -huh. with what I know it should be because uh -huh. uh, I just got a little distracted there for a little bit. Yeah. Relationships, yeah. sex, dating. <laughs> it, yeah, your birthday. My birthday. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And these are all things that we were talking about before we hit record and jumped on and uh, simply just uh, I wanted to talk about communication and sex. Yeah. Um, let's say... Do you want to talk about what we're talking about? Yeah, we can weave it in for sure, okay. absolutely. Let's say we're dating somebody new, mm -hmm. and there's no standard timeline whatsoever on when a couple mm -hmm. needs to have sex. Correct. Like third date, fifth date, tenth date, 
marriage. It's marriage. I mean, that's somebody's choice, absolutely. And and if that's it, then we need to respect it. Yeah. That's a boundary that they've set for themselves. Mm-hmm. I've contemplated it, but no, it's not realistic for me. Yeah. I'm 39. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm married, but I get questions around my boys. They're five and three of what I hope for them in terms of their values and decision making around sex and when to have it. And I said, honestly, if they wait till marriage, I'm delighted because as long as there's a rationale. So if mm-hmm. they wait till marriage, my guess would be that they would do so because they're trying to prioritize intellectual and emotional intimacy and really cultivate those two pieces or other pieces of intimacy first and then let the sexual intimacy come after marriage. Um, she's leaving now, the, who you saw in the kitchen, yeah, but she's can... waiting until marriage. Okay. And so it's really interesting to have conversations with her. She has a long-term boyfriend of four years, but she's waiting until marriage and talking to her about her rationale. Granted, she's more religious, so there is that influence. Um, now, if my boys want to have sex before marriage, I'm also fine with that. Because um, you're realistic. I'm realistic, and they'll probably want to test drive that car beforehand. <laughs> but the, val- the value sure. stands the same. I would encourage, and I want to teach them the same value. I still want them to cultivate that emotional and intellectual intimacy and have that trust before they just take their clothes off. Sure, because it's a foundation of a healthy relationship. Yeah. If we connect first on sexual yeah. chemistry and connection and then try to build the rest later, um, maybe it's not as successful. The reason it's not so successful, I think, is because when you have sex, you like literally come together and unfold and, and embrace and mm-hmm. penetration, depending mm-hmm. on what you're having for sex. But there is such a closeness and such a vulnerability. And so if you have that on a first date or really quickly, um, one, you're going to inevitably be connected to this person whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. Right? So you might not like to be connected to this person. You don't know yet. <laughs> you're going to be inevitably attached to this person. But also, you're starting, starting this foundation from a place of closeness already. Mm-hmm. You don't get the chance to actually inch your way closer and closer at your own speed and control that and, and do sort of the back and forth and, and find your way into each other. It's sort of like, here we are. And now the work is, how do we actually create the space, which is much harder to do. Yeah, once you've already integrated, yeah. basically right. you're... I don't really know who you are all that mm-hmm. well because I didn't take the time to learn you. Mm-hmm. And now instead of learning about how to come closer to you, I'm learning how to get space from you, how to pull away. Yeah. And you said a word in there that people might actually um, backpedal from, and it's control. Yeah. We're not controlling our partner with by withholding sex. Could, yes, no. Absolutely not. not, because that's not a healthy behavior at all. Yeah. And for example, like I was telling you, I've only slept with one girl this year. Yep. We waited seven weeks to actually become intimate yep. so that I felt I could um, know the person that I was dating. Great. And that was my choice. Yeah. And we both talked about it and said, are you ready? And I said, yes, I'm ready. I've been thinking about it for a few weeks. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. We were both ready, but yeah. it still didn't end up working out. Well, there was a glitch for you. That yeah, there was, a, there was a slight glitch. The glitch is if you have a conversation at week two, three, even five or six, that conversation, the assumption is that it still stands at week seven. It might not. Yeah. Things change all the time. All the time. And fluidity and flexibility is one thing about a relationship yeah. because we ebb and flow yeah. and we peak and we valley yeah. as individuals. And then there's this relationship space between us too. So, <laughs> so before you take your clothes off, yeah, you have to ask, this we as a state, is, is, are we still in an exclusive dynamic, you uh-huh. and I, is the sexual health the same? Mm-hmm. You can ask at week one, let me see your papers, or let's talk about sexual health and your, you know, it, what kind of infections you may or may not have. And then in week two or three, one of you sleeps with somebody else. Mm, because you're not then, exclusive. Right, yeah. or not yet. Uh-huh. And all that changes. Mm-hmm. So then when you sleep together again, then you mm-hmm. don't have that conversation again. Yeah, I totally get it. So open communication along the way yeah. is beneficial for everybody. Yeah. Now, how do we have those hard conversations? Just with courage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it takes Lots some courage, courage and vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's been a long time for me. Sure. I've been married for, I've been with my husband, it's going to be in two weeks. Is it two weeks is my anniversary? Yeah, two weeks is my anniversary, I don't remember. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And it'll be nine years together. But what I do tell other people is to have a conversation, make it sexy, make it fun, make it lighthearted. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of like, 
hey, I just want to check in before we do anything. Like, are we still on the same page around exclusivity? Mm -hmm. Like, that doesn't have to be, like, just the way I said that to you, I don't think that strips away the sexiness of it. It's just no, not at curious all. and yeah. forward. That yeah, be curious, be curious, be respectful. Be yeah. And uh, being forward, is that like assertive or is that just like direct? I think it's direct. Mm -hmm. um, also owning your language, right? If you're afraid, you can say, you know, I'm a little anxious about sleeping together. Or I'm a little anxious about, you know, I haven't seen you in a few weeks. I'm not quite sure where we stand. Can we clear the air? Right, I don't say anything about you. Mm -hmm. I don't say, you know, you seem to be running around and I'm not <laughs> sure, right? Right. <laughs> I'm saying, I feel anxious about where we stand. I feel nervous about this first time. I'm excited. I'm aroused, I'm nervous, all that can be in the room at the same time. Mm -hmm. But owning that language of the I stuff, the I language, and then the curiosity, I think is key for any relationship at any stage of a relationship. 35 years into a relationship, it's key. But that could be an easy way just to say, hey, before we actually take our clothes off, are you game for this? It's a good way to do yeah. consent too. Like, mm -hmm. hey, we're taking our clothes off. I want to just make sure you're totally into this. We can go whatever pace you want. I like that. There's a lot of respect there. There's a lot of um, intimacy. You're mm -hmm. creating a, an extra bond and connection mm -hmm. if you're open and honest. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So um, what happens if we're not clear on where we stand? Well, why don't you tell us, Dave? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I've been professing all this time of like not bringing my own dating life into the podcast. But you know what? I think I'm doing a disservice to our audience when I hold back. You're withholding. Yeah, and, and that's not fair to anybody. Yeah. But this is also not a place for me to like air out my dirty laundry. Right, can you, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. How much do we self-disclose to the public or our clients so that it's helpful? but not um, about only about us. It's mm -hmm. not our therapeutic process, and it's also not an overload, and now they have like too much information about us. Because I do a lot of self-disclosure, and the reason I do that, I think about everything I say in terms of my own life and what I share, mm -hmm. because I want it to be helpful. Mm -hmm. It brings humanity to me. I'm a human, you know, my, my clients can connect with me, um, and I have a lot, of, you know, you don't get to my chair in terms of doing sex therapy and that, you know, any therapist, any psychologist, you don't get to that position unless you have your own fair share of sure. stuff yep. in Pandora's box to sort of Yeah, because you've seen results from your own personal work. That and also just knowing that there's a lot of psychological stuff to sift through and if you've personally done it, then mm -hmm. I don't know a single psychologist who does not have uh, an unscathed... Every coach needs a coach. Every yeah, exactly. doctor needs a doctor. Right. Every therapist needs a right. therapist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I like this phrase, this concept in the, the therapeutic process. Uh -huh. And our podcast is a great resource for mm -hmm. people to start the therapeutic process, but also to listen in and be a part of the human piece mm -hmm. of our community. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's been missing a lot of is just the humanizing, um, the reality. Yeah the honesty and the authenticity and transparency. And my therapeutic process is private. Mm -hmm. I do go to a counselor. I love cognitive behavior therapy. Great. I've been seeing her for a year and a half. Great. And when I wasn't seeing her for a couple months, that's when things derailed. Yeah. Oh, and, and yeah, my choices changed and my, my, um, my confidence changed, unfortunately. Yeah. But I had started a new job or a new contract work and um, I just couldn't mm -hmm. meet her during the day anymore. Uh-huh. But then as soon as that contract ended, I'm like, I gotta get back and see Hannah because my therapeutic process is so important to me. Yeah. But you know, that's a great piece of self-disclosure. You it see is, a therapist, right? it's yeah. CBT, you know, when you fall off the rails, if you don't go to therapy, you could fall off the rails. Mm -hmm. Consistency yeah. and the accountability from a third party who really isn't that invested. Right. You know, I see her checking the clock every now and then. I'm like, am I really your ideal client? <laughs> Cause I see you checking the clock. No, I've made that joke before. And, um, yeah, but we all check the clock. We because, do because we're on a time frame. Well, I, I also could get lost in a conversation with a person and if you have I, to respect the next person, yeah, the next person's mm -hmm. waiting in my waiting room. I don't mm -hmm. want to just blow through that boundary. The boundary That's why I don't take it personally. Safe. It's because yeah, I know I that. And as a, as a trainer working on the hour oh, by the yeah. hour, <clears throat> you know, I'll check and see like, is it 10 minutes left in the hour? Yeah. I need to start cooling them down and yeah. doing some stretching. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. So I've made the joke, of course, because yeah. 
it's not me taking it personally. It's just me recognizing not an eye roll, just a nice yeah. shift to the clock. Yeah. Like, am I boring you? That's interesting you catch that. Because <laughs> I always look at the clock to make sure for my, like, I'll just do a quick check. Mm -hmm. And um, I've never had someone say, why are you looking at the clock? It's right above my head. So, oh, like, okay. we're still making eye contact, and uh, occasionally it'll just be an eye like look that. up. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny to, like, tune into uh, human behavior because I'm tuned into my own behavior. And, yeah. Um, really just kind of... Uh, understanding why I do what I do. Good for you. Yeah. So we were talking about the therapeutic process. Yeah, self-disclosure, like, your dating life, disclosing your dating life and burning this previous bridge of uh, this very strong boundary that I did. Don't talk about my private life on my podcast. Yeah, right. Okay. I, I need to take ownership and personal responsibility for everything I do. So that's what I do in my own work. And taking personal responsibility, but Good. if it's anecdotal and it, if it applies and if it works, yeah. Uh, heck yeah, I'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, you asked me, and uh, seven weeks in, I thought I had been very clear on my boundary. Um, mm -hmm. We decided to have sex, and then two or three weeks later, asked for clarification. Hey, are we still on the same page? We weren't. Right. And meaning, that's, same page of sexual exclusivity. Of exclusivity at all, or exclusivity like, at all. Like of we are actually doing wanting just... a relationship, uh -huh, uh -huh. and I wanted one, and she didn't, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Like I respect where you're coming from. We had a good long conversation about why that was. Yeah. And she asked for space, and I gave it to her. It's yeah. the this the only thing I could do. So where's the mistake then? If you were to take full. Uh, I don't believe I made a mistake on. on um, if you could go back though, would you ask before you literally take off your pants for the first time? Absolutely. Hey, there was a, pants there was are a, coming off. I know there's a lot of arousal here, but yeah. just want to check. There was a there was a bottle of wine involved, and okay. I know that like alcohol numbs our intuition, and it also yeah. um, changes our decision making process totally. too. So I don't drink much. Okay. We're celebrating my birthday. Oh. Yeah. yeah okay. Right. Yeah. 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 So the mistake was that just not clarifying before intercourse happened. And had that same response been like, hey, I'm not ready for a relationship. Yeah. Okay. Then we don't go to this, then we don't go to this level. Did you kiss her and have more like affectionate or even like sensual contact in those first seven weeks? Or was there like... Oh, okay. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Getting closer and closer and closer. And then every time that opportunity arose, I'm going to use that as, uh -huh. a, as a pun here. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good pun. Yeah, right? Uh, I love talking about sex. And I love sarcasm and I love making puns and jokes like that. Mm -hmm. um, every time it came up, uh, we had both agreed we're not ready. Oh, so, so there, there was, was constant ongoing. communication. Okay, there. and so that's you would why kiss it's kiss and be like, "That's great. Let's just leave it." Well, oh, kiss and then some for sure. Okay, like if what's you, then some? Everything but. Oh well, that's interesting. So yeah. you qualified oral sex and other naked erotic activities. As not having sex. As not intercourse, yeah. Ah, so Bill Clinton, no sex with Monica? <laughs> Are you in that camp? You know, Bill Clinton was married. Oh, yes. So um, they have their own boundaries and their own clarifications and expectations around what that means to them. Yeah. I mean, I, what was I, 16, maybe 17 or something like yeah. that when the Lewinsky thing? Something like that, because we're about the same age, yeah. Yeah. So... Is it my place to, <laughs> like, judge um, what a man and a wife and then a third party? I'm not saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Hillary and Bill clearly have their own no, yeah. open who knows what. That's my assumption. I'm, don't, I'm not their therapist. I have no idea. Exactly. But looking at the sustainability of their marriage all these decades and the publicity of their sex lives, mm -hmm. life, maybe not lives, his life, but anyway... Um, Clearly, they have some arrangement that works for them. I actually use them as a great example for couples. When I have my couples sit down, I'm like, the first thing we're going to do is build our relationship vision. What are your mutual goals? What keeps you together for the long term? So there's different kinds of marriages. Let's look at the Clintons. My hunch is that they don't have a lot of sex together, never have. <laughs> my hunch is that it's a business political marriage and it works fabulously for them because they're aligned on their, their goals and... You know, you don't have to agree with them. You can agree or disagree. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. More of it works for them. They're mm -hmm. still married. Mm -hmm. So let's. <laughs> but my let's, question yeah, was for yeah. you was because it's an interesting. Was that sex or not? 
Yeah, yeah. because so many people have do all these <coughs> other erotic activities like oral sex and hand jobs and whatnot, and they're like, well, that's not sex. That's not intimacy. Mm-hmm. And I actually find oral sex to be one of the Incredibly most intimate, intimate, right? Yeah. yeah. So to answer your question, uh, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, was that sex or not? Yeah. Well, I think that in my perspective, I heard, was that infidelity or not? Oh, no, no. The question was, right. you know, President Clinton, did you have sex with that yeah, woman? Yeah, right. And he said, and he said I said, did no. not have sex with that woman. Right. <laughs> right. So, Oral sex doesn't count. And I'm like, <laughs> to him, absolutely. And, to him. And, of course, when we talk about waiting seven weeks to have sex, that's intercourse. Okay. And then the building up of a relationship, the building up of connection, mm-hmm. included everything but. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so you were building some erotic intimacy mm-hmm. towards intercourse. Yeah. Okay. And that, that's a good. that's a good pace for me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying that like every relationship. What date did you have an orgasm? <laughs> On what date did I have an orgasm? Uh, <laughs> that's that's a that's an interesting question. Can I can I count the number of dates and also <laughs> count the number of orgasms? That's funny. Uh, I don't know. Um, three, four, five, somewhere in there. Okay. You know, dating once a week. Yeah. Uh, consistently. Yeah. Yeah. Talking in between dates. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, the adult thing to do, or I always grew up having phone conversations. Yeah. And I actually had phone conversations yeah. in between, which mm-hmm. is really cool. Yeah. Um, I absolutely love that versus <laughs> text all the yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, Um, tomorrow's episode, um, we're recording this in September. So tomorrow's episode is called when to give your, when to give them the benefit of the doubt. And in the beginning of a relationship, texting too frequently, texting too infrequently, it's all about expectations and boundaries for me. Yeah. It pairs with intentions as well. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody's intentions are not to get into an exclusive relationship, then their text behavior is going to be completely different. Yeah. And they may not even have a phone call with you at all. Right. You may never return a phone call if you leave a voicemail. Right. But text behavior is not necessarily about relationship intention only. That's text right. behavior yeah. could be about their attachment orientation. Ooh, let's dive into that because <laughs> my point on the podcast episode, and I hope everybody's been able to listen to it. If you haven't, scroll back through and look, look up when to give them the benefit of the doubt. I brought up the point of like, we're all busy adults. We have a full-time job, we have mm-hmm. families, we have travel, we have health. Yeah. I've been sick for two weeks. I don't know if I've consistently texted anybody. Yeah. You know, because I just need to back off and um, take care of myself for a little bit. Yeah. So how is text behavior a lot like attachment? It, well, there's a few components. One, it's your relationship to the phone. So if you're okay. a more anxious person, you're gonna be on the phone and the screen more just because mm-hmm. there's that. Number one reason why we do the social media detox every weekend as a group. Yeah. But if you're an avoidant person and you're avoiding human contact, you may also be on your screen kind of like, oh, this is a great barrier. Good barrier. Yeah. Yeah, do that. So it could be an avoidant or an anxious um, relationship, but the texting is a different type of relationship. Like I have friends. One friend is clearly a more anxious attachment, and this friend likes to text all the time. And Three like, or four, triple texts, oh, double yeah. texts. Like back forth, back forth, talk, 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 talk about nothing. Like, it's just back forth, back forth. Um, and, but I am more that way, too. So this is a good, you know, this friend works well because... Fun dynamic. Yeah, because it's like, oh, my husband is very, very avoidant. Like, I'll text him, and then I'll be like, like, do you want the bananas at the store? And then I'll be like, do you want these bananas at the store? Do we have bananas at home? Please just answer me. That's yes or so no. Funny. <laughs> just answer me. So that's like, <laughs> that's like running our, our relationships in a business kind of a way of like transactional. Um, I need to send this text for an answer back quickly. Like, yes. hey, I'm on my way to pick up the kids. You don't have to pick them up today. Yeah. I know we talked about that this morning. Right. You, you may want them to receive that text pretty quick. Right. But say like in the very beginning of a relationship, it's a dance. It's, it's almost like a negotiation, dance. and it's also um, understanding who that person is be it based on their attachment style. Yeah, like I know that well, I'm more of a, I, I was more, when I was dating, more ambivalent attachment. And I dated before dating apps came to town, but there was definitely texting. It was actually even before iPhones. It was like, you know, remember when right. you'd be like, 
click, 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 click. S, 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 you know. <laughs> to, what a nightmare. <laughs> I had to click the number seven three times oh to get God. to the S. Yes. Yeah. Oh, God. But I, yes. I remember that too. The Nokia. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> and I remember, so, but I remember, I was like, I know that I'm more anxious and I'm going to overwhelm this dating partner and I'm going to smother them with my anxiety. Now, I knew that about myself. Mm -hmm. If I text too much, if I get into this, then mm -hmm. I want lots of answers. And I'm kind of verbose. So I was like, I'm going to send the text. And then I'm literally going to look at the clock. There's no timers on the phone back then. I'm going to look at the clock. And I'm not going to pick up this phone for 20 minutes. Good boundaries Good for boundaries. yourself. Right. And yeah. I'm not going to respond. You know, If I get a text back in those 20 minutes, I'm going to wait another 20 minutes to respond. Sure. Like I'm going to really space it out. So that I don't just like vomit my anxiety right. into this dynamic. Some people outside looking in, if the, I was having this conversation, and I I try to do the same thing. And Would like, say I'm playing a game. Uh, yeah, exactly. However, this is about you. Yeah. And you're speaking of it from your um, boundaries you need to set with your cell phone. Yeah. And with your self awareness. Yeah. Which is so important yeah. to understand. And I do the same exact thing. It's like. Um, as Americans today, we busy ourselves with so much stuff. Yes. Uh, sometimes to distract us from texting back too early. Yeah. Too soon. Oh, I want to look like I'm really busy. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely playing a game and not setting healthy boundaries. Right. In my case, I was thinking about this this past week because I went out on a date uh, the other day. It went better than I thought it was going to. Mm -hmm. And I was a little caught off guard by like, I'm a little excited. Mm -hmm. That's fun. That's yeah. new to me. That's yeah. that's great. It's been over a month since the relationship that we were just talking about uh -huh. ended. Okay. So I'm like, well, that's that's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm going to be paying attention to that. But I was getting to the point of like understanding text behavior between the two of us. Mm -hmm. I'm like, huh, it's been about a day since I've heard from her. And I asked a question relevant to our date. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, hey, how was the crush wall later that night? Mm -hmm. and didn't hear back from for for like a day mm -hmm. which is totally fine yeah. but here's what I did I just stuck to doing me yeah I went to jujitsu on a Sunday for an hour and a half didn't even think about the text message before or after but came out of that class and I'm like oh it's been an hour and a half since she texted me mm -hmm. now that I'm done with my jujitsu class I can easily text back yeah and it's not like I saw the text set another 20 minute timer yeah and then texted back no yeah. it was like Huh, I'm just simply aware I was doing something that I'm passionate about, I care about. Yeah. And then naturally it occurred that I wanted to text right after that class. Yeah. It's a good check in for me. Yeah. I'm like where I'm at personally. Yeah. But it sounds like you're trying to manage. Are you more, I think I remember this one. Are you more avoidant, right? Um, I was. Um, so did we talk about the pendulum swing? So you're ambivalent. No, 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 no. no. Okay. No. Uh, the pendulum swing from secure in the middle, anxious on one side, and avoidant on the other. Yeah. In yeah. Re response to our partner, we swing one way or the other. Yeah. If we start out at secure. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when I'm alone, I'm a secure attachment. Okay. And then... There's nobody to feed off of. Yeah, that's exactly correct. And that's a good check-in for me is like, when I do meet somebody new and I am thinking of dating them or exclusively or whatever the relationship level is and I see myself swinging with this pendulum from one side to the other yeah. and I go towards that avoidant, mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, Dave, who did you used to be when you were purely avoidant mm. in two long-term relationships? Three and a half years each, I was avoidant the whole time. Okay. Never once swung back to, yeah, I was getting closer to skier, mm -hmm. you know, in that time frame, but mm -hmm. never really anxious attached. Mm -hmm. And that was an awareness for me of like understanding the book attached, reading through it, understanding a little bit more about it, and then processing what happened in two long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, why is that? Mm -hmm. Well, the avoidance comes from a history of trauma. Okay, now I need to work on the trauma. Yeah. Like you were saying earlier about everyone has a little bit of stuff. Oh, yeah. Right? And it was showing up in these relationships as avoidant attached. Yeah. But even with friends, like, so my husband's more of the, avo he's secure avoidant, and I'm more secure ambivalent. And the only reason I can actually add the word secure is because I got married and I, like, settled in. Nine years now. Yeah. <laughs> but I can see with my friends, like, the one friend that, like, goes back and forth with me, we're sort of, like, the same human. And so the back and forth is easy because 
it, it feeds, but if I have other friends who won't respond to me for a day or multiple hours, I'm like, like, come on, just respond to me. And they're just friends. Like, yeah. I have no tether to, like, anything, emo- you know, sexual or emotional. Mm-hmm. It's more of, like, I mean, yes, I was emotional, but sure. it's, like... Because we talked about it last time we, last time we talked about friends can give us intimacy. Yes. And that physical intimacy that I yeah. feel when I'm at jujitsu, that's intimacy. Yeah. Right? And that can be a part of the whole... Of the whole of the whole being I am yeah receiving intimacy so mm-hmm. when you talk about your friends and the communication styles that's important yeah when it comes to building intimacy with your friends but it's interesting with the text like it's just there's so much nuance right it's it's part of it is our individual relationships with our phone mm-hmm. part of it is our relationship to attachment mm-hmm. and part of it is our relationship to this other person mm-hmm. you know some people I'm, I'm quicker to respond to some people I'm like oh you know what this is the type of friendship that like I can wait a day or two. Sure. They're like, what am I bringing to your house next week for the meal? And I'm like, I'll think about that. Like, I'm not going to respond <laughs> for a day or two. I don't know. I don't know. I really yeah. don't know. So I'm not going to give you a response. Yeah. In my, fi- in my family dynamic, um, I left a voicemail for my sisters and my mom all on the same day. Uh-huh. And then they start to drip in and re- return my phone calls. My mom's very quick to respond. Yeah. My middle sister is... Uh, not as quick, but still same day. Yeah. Because she's very black and white. Uh-huh. She's like, morally. Uh-huh. What do I need to do morally to return the phone call to my brother? And then my oldest sister is, you know, hippie and just like nonchalant. Just like, ah, whatever. It was a week. And I finally got a hold of my sister. But my sister, my middle one, says, Hey, Dave, um, my middle daughter is having a birthday party tomorrow at Aurora Reservoir. Tomorrow? Yeah. This is my this is my family dynamic where yeah, you're like, like how about some pre notice uh-huh. <laughs> and I, I got twenty four hours notice and I, I, have a busy I life. I do and I had a date scheduled and then I had lunch and the UFC fights with my roommate mm-hmm. which was a day thing because it was in Abu Dhabi and it was actually worked out great for oh, me to watch the fights at two o'clock instead of eight o'clock yeah it's great for me yeah then there's no alcohol involved yeah because I have shit to do the rest of the day so I. I felt as if I would respond as quickly as I could, letting her know I wouldn't be there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. I unfortunately already had plans. Yeah. Old me would have been like getting pissy and a little passive aggressive and saying, right. like, you "Oh, you could give time. me some more notice." Yeah. If she had asked, "Hey, Dave, can you get Madison, your daughter, to come with you?" I would have said something like, "Yes, with a week's notice, I might have been able to do that." Yeah. Not really poking at the lack of invitation mm-hmm. my family doesn't listen to podcasts so i'm not like burning a bridge here by, <laughs> by like throwing my sister under a bus yeah it's just our family dynamic why doesn't your family listen to your podcast um because let's see my middle sister's been married for 20 years uh-huh. uh the myth of arrival of like oh, i'm arrived i've been settled into this relationship for 20 years i'm so busy in my own personal life i don't know if dave's podcast would bring a value to my life okay are you the baby i am the baby okay we can talk about that later if you want. Because there's this light bulb that goes off in your head. Um, but then my friend Shelly... It was actually math I was doing. Oh, was it really? Because if you're 39, just recently, um, and she's been married for 20 years, I'm like, well, how much older does she have to be? She's two and a half years older than I am. Oh, she's going to be young. 21, I think. That's a young marriage in the uh-huh. same age. And then uh, she waited till marriage, speaking of. Interesting. Yeah, but he was 19 or 20. I think he was 20 at the time. Wow. Uh, very Christian family, mm-hmm. um, good values. I mean, they've yeah. stayed together almost like some turbulent stuff with their their youngest child um, that comes between them, but none of my business really right now. And so my friend Shelly, who I've known for 15 years, has been married for six or seven years now. Okay. And she's like, Dave, I was hesitant to listen to your podcast because I didn't think it would apply to me being a married woman. Uh-huh. I'm not out there dating. But when I started listening, these principles that you're talking about on the podcast, they apply to everybody. Yeah. And my family doesn't know that. Yeah. You know, it's not like I, I'm i sharing a direct link to this podcast episode I'm so proud of with yeah. my sisters. Yeah. My oldest sister listens, uh-huh. and she actually gave me a, a request, and she said, Dave, I want to know about long distance. Dave, I want to know about friends with benefits. Yeah. So that's why we did this mini-series on... Hey guys, I'm going to send out a question. What do you want to know from me? Yeah. Well, my sister asked for two episodes good for her. and she loves it. She's just like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Because that friends with benefits thing, it really hit home. She's 46 and has a friend with benefits. Okay. Or at least she did in the past. I don't yeah, know where yeah. they're at right yeah. now. But she tells me 
based on that episode, she ended it with the friend with benefits because it wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. And it brought a ton of value to her life. Yeah, interesting. So I guess when I said earlier my family doesn't listen to podcasts, she does. that's not true. And she yeah. ended it. That's interesting. We talked a little bit about friends with benefits too. I, I think so. One. Because it's a it's an unclear relationship definition. Right. And you could be sleeping it's, with multiple people at the same time. A hundred percent. And the third piece is usually there's an inequity of expectations. Yep, and somebody's always going to get hurt. Right. Usually yeah. one person's like, oh yeah. I caught just, feels. Yeah. Just me and him or whatever, me and her. <coughs> and, and the other person's like, yeah, you're one of six. Yeah. So, and how does that make people feel? Terrible. And that's why we're talking about it. Yeah. yeah. Just a part of the... Um, my friend Jess, who hosts a podcast in San Diego, she did. Uh, they stopped recording, but the episodes are still available. The Singling Podcast. I'm texting back and forth with her. And... Like this, All back, the, forth, quick, quick? Or no? Nah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. When we, when we talk from like 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, it's mm-hmm. back and forth. Okay. But like if we text during her work day... It's slow. Uh, yeah, slow. That makes sense. But it's maybe like once a week because that's the type of friendship yeah. that we have. You know, just a friend, former guest on the podcast mm-hmm. that I reach out to and I tell her stories. Uh-huh. And I'm telling her this story and she's like, oh, Dave, it totally sounds like you're on the bench. You're not in the starting lineup because it's, cause it's cuffing so season right now. Oh my god, the language is hilarious. Yeah, do you know of cuffing season? No. I mean, I can make a guess. So cuffing season actually could be rooted in attachment style, so let's figure this out while we're talking. Okay. Cuffing season, let's use a sports analogy. Uh-huh. Summer is like um, spring training for yep. baseball, okay. where people go to other locations and they enjoy the weather, right. they enjoy a more relaxed um, dating environment like spring training. For baseball players, it's more relaxed. Oh. Well, okay, so let's just get clarity because mm-hmm. I, I love, I'm an athlete, but I don't follow professional sports mm-hmm. so well. Um, so what I know, <laughs> I actually have this game, everybody loves to play this game with me, like name a sports team, uh, any sports team. Carolina Panthers. Well, I'm going to guess that's in the Carolinas somewhere. Sure, okay, sure. <laughs> but if you just... Oh, said, right, just the team name. Yeah, just the okay, team name. Okay, the Giants. The Giants, okay, I have to guess the sport and the state. <laughs> <laughs> this is a trick question. Go uh, for it. <laughs> terrible at the game, though. It's really fun to play. Uh-huh. I'm going to go with New York basketball. So, New York is correct. It's okay. a football team. But there's okay. also the Giants baseball team in San Francisco, California. Okay. So, it's a trick question. Okay. Well, that's good. So, let's get... So, let's, baseball players yep. go to a new location for spring training to have nice weather and do intense yep. training on their sport. In Arizona from. and Florida. Okay. And it's, it's less intense games... But it's more intense strength and conditioning training oh, okay. because they're getting ready for the season because gotcha. their their season is so long. Okay. So let's say that like um, the summer months for daters is spring training where we're really loose and we're enjoying our friendships and we're okay. we're not intensely playing a game. Okay. Right, and then comes around fall, which we're in September now. Yeah. September is like. Preseason or tryouts is what they are. Okay. We're trying out two or three or four or five people where we're dating casually. Okay, so you've maybe had ten fluid go on dates and now we're whittled yeah. it down to two or three. Yeah, maybe over summer we were like starting to develop our bench players, you know, those who are not starters. Then we're having tryouts of our bench players. Okay. And then eventually at the end of September, mid October, it's starting to cool down. Now we want a warm body for the winter. Yes. And so it's known as cuffing season because we want to get cuffed up for the winter. Oh, interesting. And October comes around and it's more like, okay, tryouts are over. We've got two or three starters yeah. that we see more often. Okay. And the kind of the... What sport are we playing now? I went from like, ba- I went from like baseball to basketball to <laughs> five. And I'm like, we're doing tennis. <laughs> and it could be any of the more major four sports because they have an in-season, post-season, yeah, pre-season. I'm playing, but yeah. yeah. Okay. So you have to make your choice. Is there really a cycle like this? Or I think it's biological. Like... I think it's yeah, um, anthropo- anthropologically biological because when do babies get born? Spring, yeah, right? Totally. So in September, October, November, we're getting cuffed up with somebody to stay yes. warm through the winter and we're having sex and somebody gets pregnant. Yeah. The next spring, somebody has... And a, I got together with my husband in, in uh, the fall. In the fall. Right? Yeah. So it's kind of like peak season for relationships starting. Yeah. We don't want to go through the holidays alone. Yeah. Um, we're all just like kind of playing with this analogy a lot. Yeah. 
but it's an unconscious kind of biological behavior. Totally. Oh, that, it's so fascinating. That's fun to play with a little bit from our perspective mm -hmm. as we're talking about it today. Um, and why? So your friend Jess says you're not getting cuffed with someone or something. What did she call you out on? Sure. She she called me a bench player, not a starter. Oh. Right. Okay. And if we if we talk about this season of life, like summer is very lighthearted and fluid and we're trying out a bunch of different people on for size yeah. and our attachment style can actually come into play there. Maybe the avoidant yeah. is, is like, um, well, I'm not really so hot on that. So I'm going to not text very frequently with that person as frequently as yeah. maybe my starter, Yeah, you know, yeah, the yeah. front runner or the person who's right. tops of our list or something mm -hmm. like that. But an anxious attached, would maybe have a different behavior around that of like, I'm going to text all six guys a lot yes. so that I can keep them all on the hook right? so that I have my number one choice available to me. Yes. Yes. Because they have abandonment wounds. And if mm. I have six pots boiling on my stove top, you know, if a few fall off, that's okay because I've got these other ones. Uh-huh. If I burn the veggies over there or if I... Okay, I've got veggies over here. Yeah, if I overcook my, my <laughs> chicken... I love that. Actually, that analogy is great. Um, so let's talk about abandonment, and then they gravitate to six people to have options. Is that what, is that what's going on there? That could be one way <laughs> it looks in dating. It also looks that way in polyamory. Okay. We talked about that yeah, last we did. time, where people who gravitate towards polyamory with that abandonment wound running the show will do that. They want to have multiple partners so that again, if one of the stove, if one of the pots. Mm -hmm. falls off the stove or burns mm -hmm. you have other ones available mm -hmm. to you yeah so you're never really abandoned because you have multiple options it's a pr protective mechanism and I can see that for sure and I like this this saying this phrase hurt people hurt people mm -hmm. and yeah. it's, it's heartbreaking yeah. because that wound the abandonment wound yeah. if left unhealed will keep repeating and repeating and repeating yeah. and and all of the people who are tragically hurt along the way yeah Hurt people hurt people. That's really powerful, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I was hurt for a long time and I blamed others. And until I took personal responsibility for my actions and my choices and my intentions, I was going to continue to hurt people. Mm -hmm. And that's not okay with me. Yeah. Do you, as an avoidant attachment, then make an extra effort to text more, reach out more, or try to make reaches knowing it's not in your nature? I would say. In the past, no, I wouldn't do that. I was just straight avoidant. Yeah. I'm just like, um, well, I'm not that invested anyways. Yeah. You know? So I'll let them initiate text conversation every time. Yeah. And now that I've chosen uh, a more healthy way of life, mm -hmm. balancing my fitness and my nutrition and my, my mental health, yeah. my spiritual health, my financial mm -hmm. health, all these five pillars are so important mm -hmm. to me to be prepared for a relationship that's going to be mm -hmm. long lasting. Yeah. So as an avoidant now, I'm so much more geared towards one-on-one -on -one connection mm -hmm. than I am actually like the self-preservation mm -hmm. of the avoidant attachment. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to get hurt mm -hmm. and yet still try again. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that, do avoidance really get hurt or do they end up just sort of putting on their armor and crawling into their hole? Which is how I know now that I'm no longer avoidant primarily. Okay. I've swung that pendulum back towards the center of secure attachment, uh -huh. even if I am seeing somebody new. Yeah. And it comes from self-awareness. And therapy. And therapy, absolutely. So the cognitive behavior therapy changes the way that I think mm -hmm. about myself, mm -hmm. about my relationships. Yeah. Um, Maybe not so much about my career, but when we do talk about my career in my sessions, we definitely zero in on a healthy way to think about it. Yeah. Because it's up and down as a business owner all the time. Mm -hmm. And we need to be more resilient. You can't get your self-esteem hurt. Oh, I am defective because business yeah. is up or down. Yeah. Or down, really. I cannot have the, um, like, uh, Attachment we're talking about it all the time. I cannot be attached to the outcome of my business right because whether or not my business fails that has You're not defective because of that. That's right. correct. Right. It's not a direct reflection right. on me as a person right on my effort Yes on my choices along the way as a business owner. Yes yeah. So those are the things that I need to take personal responsibility for yeah, excuse me professional responsibility professional for mm -hmm. 
but it comes from me as a person. Yeah. I'm a personal trainer because I always root for the underdog, according mm -hmm. to my Enneagram. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You're, you're a seven or something? I'm an eight. You're an eight. So uh, my, when I'm at my best, I cheer and I root for the underdog. Huh. Well, the women that were coming to me in my personal training business are the ultimate underdog. Sometimes single moms. Sometimes uh -huh. women who had weight loss goals. And they could never lose it on their own. That's an underdog to my heart. Does, do you have awesome boundaries when it comes to like cute single moms that are underdogs and you want to save them? What do you mean by boundaries? Like, do you want to date them and do you ever ask them on a date? Or you like, so I would, say, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say that that type of a person gravitates to me because of the strength and the confidence and the, and the safety that my personality type and yeah. my behavior and my um, persona kind of has available yeah. to me. Um, I do go at a slower pace with somebody of that demographic, like a single mom. Um, you go at a slower pace dating or you go at a slower pace training them? Dating. Uh, training, I have extreme boundaries. Okay. I've never dated a client. Okay. Um, a former girlfriend became a client. That's a different story. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Great. Yeah. Great boundaries. Yeah. So never mix business with pleasure. Never yeah. used... Uh, consultation in my personal training business to get close to a woman yeah. Good at for all you. because I just knew better like yeah. you don't know. four years of education at Metro State taught me ethics and it taught me yeah. appropriate behavior working with female classmates you know female mm -hmm. professors mm -hmm. um, I never knew that my niche would be 25 to 40 year old women mm -hmm. that's just who gravitated to me mm -hmm. because they needed uh, the strength and the intensity and in an appropriate um, in the safe environment container. Yeah, because mm -hmm. if we can control in a safe environment, pushing you outside of your comfort zone to get to your weight loss goals, strength training goals, then everything else outside of that is going to be easier. Yeah. But if I violated that one time, right, it's not safe. It's not safe anymore yeah. for a lot of people to come into. Yeah. I don't know how long we've been talking, but we have not gotten to sex yet, and you're like, today, <laughs> today we're going to talk about sex, and we have barely talked about sex except to say that right. maybe. Communicating yes. along the way, uh, yes. right before it happens, have, is a good thing. We had a lot of erotic activities built up towards the course. That's about it. And I know why that is. Why? Because in a relationship or in a situation or in infidelity, the sex it can kind of be a symptom of other things going on in our past, in our trauma, in our relationship. Mm -hmm. Like if a couple is not having sex, why is that? Mm -hmm. It's not just the sex. Oh, sure not. It's everything underlying of like trust yeah. and intimacy and quality time together. And, and that's why we haven't talked about sex because it's kind of a result of All this other stuff X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Which is what I do every day. Yeah. You peel back the layers of the onion yeah. to get to the root of why a couple's not having sex or why it's not enjoyable or why they don't have trust around it. Yeah. Why they don't have boundaries around it to delineate what those boundaries are. Right. Because like, uh, one partner may want to explore and the other partner is really right. kind of a starfish. What's a starfish? I'm learning all these terms. Where they just kind of, as the partner, just kind of lay there and no hip movement, no body movement. Oh my goodness, right? that's amazing. Okay, I used to call this a dead fish, but starfish is Yeah, because better. they have the, the five <laughs> points of the body that are just kind of like... Starfish. Laying there, right? I, I, you must think I live under a rock. I'm like, oh, no, you just come at, your, come at it from a clinical and a professional standpoint. Yeah. Starfish is not in my clinical training. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why not. Just That's kidding. hilarious. <laughs> That's really so funny. Great, though. Um, but it's interesting because I do get phone calls from prospective clients and they'll say, you know, we do have these sexual problems, but we don't know if you're the right therapist for us because really you know underlying it we have all these emotional problems and blah 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 and I'm like what do you think I do yeah like the, we, I'm like the only difference between I shouldn't say the only difference it's a big difference between myself and other marriage therapists and I have an LMFT I, my license is in marriage and family therapy as I say we add in the sexuality piece but we inevitably have to talk about the mm -hmm. underlying iceberg which is everything else related to intimacy and attachment and dynamics mm -hmm. and the whole system. I mean, the whole system is, is key. Yeah. You know, the sex is the tip of the iceberg. It's what gets right. people in the door because it's like, oh, this is the symptom that's not working. Yeah, exactly. And great awareness for that client who calls you up and says, we have emotional stuff plus yeah, the sex that's true. stuff. I mean, that's a huge stride forward uh, in getting somebody to 
actually see results from therapy. Yeah. And as a couple or as an individual. Mm-hmm. Like that's a great person to start yeah. with. I yeah. don't think you see very many people like that. <laughs> when I spell it out for them, because my husband and I are writing a book and we have a roadmap, basically. It's called mm-hmm. Roadmap to Intimacy. But the roadmap I spell out for couples in the beginning is just like a little cheat sheet where I'm like, this is the, this is the map that I'm, this is the map we're going to go on, basically. And you know, there's emotional intimacy and then physical and then sensual and then sexual. And so we really need to make sure we are patching all the holes in your garden hose for mm-hmm. all of these stages. So I say, we have to start with your emotional intimacy mm-hmm. and your communication and anything you're withholding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Get a feedback loop of generosity. We have a lot of different like components of that stage. But I'll tell them, like, yes, you think you're here because your sex life is in, you know, the toilet. Wow. Yeah. Right. But. Or well, non-existent. But we got yeah. all these other pieces or why it's in the toilet. Right. So if they don't have the self-awareness, I deliver that to them. Yeah. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you say to somebody who comes to you and they want to, like, quick fix and they want to get to the root of the problem, like, right away? I have this analogy. Let me run it by you. Where you have an onion and you slice it down the middle to get to the root of the problem. Mm-hmm. And because of that, you're going to get some tears. Yep. You're, you're going to have a reaction to the, what you find when you slice in the middle. It's like doing ayahuasca or mushrooms or, or some, some of these other um, drugs, um, especially in microdose, but... Expanding your mind to get it to... It just opens, it cracks open mm-hmm. into Pandora's box and flips the lid mm-hmm. right open. There's he, no like crack, crack, crack. Yeah, and here's the analogy where it gets good for your profession and, and what you do so well. You have two halves of an onion and they still have layers that we're going to have to peel back in order to get really to the root of it. Yeah. So although you wanted a quick fix and you sliced down the middle of the onion and you saw some tears initially, you only saw one dimension of who you are and who you are in this relationship. Mm -hmm. But if you peel back the layers of the onion on both halves now that you have, there's still going to be tears. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a slower process. Mm -hmm. And it it might be uh, less rewarding to go at that slow pace, but Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. Where, Where does that land with you? Um, I, that's a great question because I, I, I come back to this ayahuasca or mushroom mm-hmm. or other or even cannabis people who are trying on these different things to like slice down the middle and open up stuff for instant gratification and a quick fix yeah and also <laughs> to like jump to the meat and the depth of it immediately mm-hmm. um, and I think everybody's wired and programmed differently so depending on your background depending on your trauma and if you do that with somebody who's highly traumatized or has a lot in there that they don't even know is in there mm-hmm. it's gonna like rattle their nervous system into outer space and they may regress as opposed to progress it may just bring up so much it's intolerable to handle in the nervous system and so they're gonna find themselves working in something else in a really po- poignant way okay. um, I'm more of a believer if you go your body and your brain have certain defense mechanisms especially in childhood that helped you survive they may be outdated in adulthood, but you have to be able to see that and consciously let go of them so that you can start to come to the, the self you want to be as an adult. And so the brain and the body will do that at the pace that's right for you. So that's, I think, peeling the layer of the onion at the right pace that's right for you. You know, So somebody who's highly traumatized, they're not going to just <laughs> get into there. You know, they might be like, holy cow. Yeah. You know, uh, They might need to like peel slowly. Like somatic experiencing work, for instance, it's a, it's a type of, uh, it's like, do you know Peter Levine's somatic experiencing work? I've, I've heard of it. Um, it's very slow. You do mm-hmm. like, it's, it's just frame by frame to just start to feel. Um, you pair, you know, the incident with your somatic experience of it. And you're sort of pairing it so it's congruent and you're starting to feel it. So it's just a slower peeling. But you're actually like getting your nervous system into alignment and feeling. But also being able to regulate yourself through it. Um, so yeah, you ask about the peeling of the onion. I think as humans, we're going to peel the onion at a pace that works for us, based on our defenses, and different people are going to slice or peel at different speeds <laughs> yeah. and do it in different ways. I don't right. know if that really answers your question. It does, absolutely. And like coming from your professional standpoint, it's nice to have a balance between, say like my personality type, wants to slice down the middle and get to the root of it Same. to fix it like right yeah. away. Well, that definitely wasn't working for me for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So peeling back the layer, and I'm still seeing my counselor uh, every other week now. Mm 
-hmm. For a long time, it was every week. Then we went to once a month. That wasn't helping. Yeah. Every other week is our sweet spot. I feel like we always have our core wound with us till the day we die. Right? It's how we actually orient around that core wound and do different chapters of work. I've had different ways of working my core wound through my whole life, and they're all like they're all in different venues of just like martial arts is a different way to work it. Oh, you know? for sure. I imagine mm -hmm. you know I watch it with my son and my husband who do Easton. And, you know, just the way it cultivates confidence and masculinity. Mm -hmm. Maybe not masculinity for my five-year-old, but, you know. I think it's preparing him for something like oh, that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the confidence that it takes to face adversity and to become more resilient, yeah. jujitsu is the best thing I've ever yeah. experienced for that. Yeah. He's five. He's like 35 pounds. And recently he tried to, like, take me down. And he actually, I'm like, you are strong, buddy. Uh -huh. Of course, I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway. Sure, he has some technique there too. Yeah. And at five years old, it's a lot more play. It's a lot more wrestling. Yeah. Um, with some foundational techniques too. Yeah. Which no, they I learned some cool mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, he learned yeah. some of the, I don't know what it is, but some of the yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, the, the training experience I've had this week has brought me back to who I am um, at, at most or at best who I am. Mm -hmm. Like... Uh, I took some time off and then I've had two of the best training sessions I've ever had mm -hmm. as a blue belt anyways mm -hmm. um, Still haven't been promoted to that first strike because I've been inconsistent But I always remember on the days of a promotion a uh -huh. new stripe or a new belt are the best days of sparring that I've because there's yeah. confidence there right. and there's accomplishment and yeah. there's like I'm actually progressing down the road. Yes, and there's humility I remember when my husband was waiting for his blue belt like every stripe along the way in the white process or as he was building towards blue belt, was so humbling because he's like seeing belts in the corner yeah. and he's like, is it me today? Is it me? And it was like never him. Yeah. And he's like, this is just so humbling to just be in the process and not get the belt. Like it's not about the trophy or the destination. It's about like being on the mat. Yep. So, Every day is the journey along the way. Yeah. And if you skip too much time, your, your journey gets derailed. And yeah. it's a really good metaphor for life and personal growth. Yeah. It's a great place to begin learning so much about yourself yeah yeah that's why i'll stick with it for a lifetime mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so let's talk about physical fitness and uh for mental health and sexuality mm -hmm. like i yeah. know there's a benefit for um, jujitsu to make my body look better feel better work better so yeah. that i'm more sexual as a yeah. as a person and sure. you touched on masculinity too yeah yeah, masculinity is a big topic in today's age. Uh -huh. um, and it's healthy, right? Oh, I am such a big fan of, of healthy, meaningful masculinity, unapologizing. Like, I don't think men need to apologize for having a penis. Like, come on, you have one. You were born that way. You didn't choose it. I don't think people should apologize for... I don't think people should apologize for how they were born. Okay. Let's put it that way. You're born the way you're born. You don't get to choose that. What you get to choose is how you walk this planet with integrity and the personal responsibility you take for yourself mm -hmm. and, and those kinds of pieces. And so I think it's hard. We're in a really tricky age around masculinity right now because we see a lot of improper behaviors being illuminated and I'm by no means condoning those behaviors. But I think the fallout from that is that boys and men are being slaughtered around masculinity and... Um, and are getting confused on around how to be in their power without A, apologizing, and B, um, ha having power over others, right? Mm -hmm. you know, being in your power doesn't mean you have to dominate a whole set of people or another person. You can just mm -hmm. be in your power. And so I think that's a confusing message and hard to implement. And so I think meaningful masculinity is really key I mean, I have two boys, mm -hmm. you know, I want to teach them to, you know, with my husband, but I want to teach them to be awesome, ethical, respectful men in their power and to be, you know, I want them to be the ones at parties when they're in high school, like scanning the room to make sure like things are cool, right? I don't want them to be the drunk ones outside throwing up. I want them to be sort of the protectors of the party. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I don't want them to be the over caretakers and their self sacrifice and their martyrs, but I want them to just have that awareness and be embodied in their masculinity to just have that as part of their responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, Very well said. And whether we acknowledge it or not, healthy masculinity is attractive to women. A hundred percent. Right? 
oh, I can't even tell you how many of my female clients are like, my husband's really nice, but he's too nice. He's a uh-huh. doormat. Uh-huh. Or he never just takes me against the wall or throws me on the bed or uh-huh. he never just challenges me or says no to me or just tells me what he wants for dinner or makes a decision around dinner. Like, I can't tell you how many of these people, these women are, and then they're like, yeah, I have no sex drive. Yep. Wonder why. Because yeah. there's nothing to be attracted to. <laughs> uh-huh. Now, taking, a, taking somebody up against the wall and taking them in a sexual act with love Yes. Is part of healthy masculinity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if there has to be consent. They have mm-hmm. to have some Boundaries, sort of, yeah. Right. Understanding yeah. like, of course. yeah, this is sexy. And that like, what, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't be a surprise, but it can definitely be a wantingness. Yes. And I think that's where it comes from is like, right. I just want her so bad. Right. With her permission, I'll take her this way. Right. How do you channel that carnal, natural, biological, testosterone-fueled carnalness and lust into a consenting dynamic mm-hmm. where it can be really sexy. And mm-hmm. I think most women want that. Of course. I, I've heard it as well. Yeah. So to have your clientele say the same thing. Yeah. And, uh, we were talking about Jeff Lawton beforehand and the evolving man is, is formulated around no more Mr. Nice Guy. Oh, that's great. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And the nice guy syndrome of mm-hmm. just like being a doormat, mm-hmm. being too passive, mm-hmm. not asking for what they want. Mm-hmm. That's not healthy masculinity. That's not even masculinity no. at all. Yeah. It's weakness. But you have to have compassion for those people, right? Because it comes from a place from childhood where you probably had to be hyper vigilant of your environment. If it was a chaotic or unsafe environment, alcoholic father, neglectful. absentee father, absentee, something, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're like, I'm tracking my environment to make sure I'm, I'm safe as a kid. Um, then they learn to be hyper vigilant of their environment and not to rock the boat and not to step on the eggshells. So then they become nice guys. Yeah. Because it was a learned defense mechanism. Yep. And we could probably do a follow up episode on Lots that one thing right yeah. there, you know, because uh, appreciate your, your female perspective and your clinical perspective on that too, mm-hmm. because I can study all day long and be self-aware of nice guy tendencies yeah. to correct them along the way, mm-hmm. but I'll still make mistakes, yeah. you know, and I'll still be human, yeah. and I'll still, on occasion, get my feelings hurt and be passive-aggressive, mm-hmm. but I'm cleaning that shit up. Good. Yeah. Good. Because it's, it's not healthy for me as, a, as an integrous person. Right. It's a form of manipulation, and I'm eliminating it from my life. Yeah. Because <clears> it doesn't belong in my next relationship or my current one or wherever right. I'm at. My business, professional, friends, co-workers, family. Yeah. So bringing it full circle. Yeah. With that botched experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll call it that. Yeah, that's where you, if you were to edit, hey, I mean, I said this before, but mm-hmm. like, hey, right now I want to name my need. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm aroused, I'm excited, just want to make sure yep. we're good and on the same page. Yep. Because of my boundary that I had set. Because of the boundary you set. For and myself. I imagine because of your... Because of the alcohol, plus it, if you had nice guy syndrome before, that need went dormant. Yeah, momentarily. Yeah, momentarily. Yeah. Oh well, you learned. Yeah, absolutely. Now you learned that you take your pants off to just make sure, okay, what's your sexual health status? Uh-huh. And we're on the same page? Okay, keep taking your clothes off. <laughs> if I'm doing a check-in personally, I can appropriately and do a check-in with my partner as well. Yeah. And that should be everyone's Goal. commitment to communicating effectively. Yeah. 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 We're not alone on this earth and we're supposed to, we're certainly not meant to be alone. No. We're oh, connecting no. humans. Yeah. yeah. We're social species. That's how we survived. We don't have long claws and sharp teeth. Yeah. Man. We gathered as a, yeah, as a community. Social. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if there's one thing we didn't touch on today, I know we went like round and round and winding road and yeah. I loved it. It was awesome. But if there's one thing you want to leave us with today, what would it be? Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, there's so many different messages. I'm, um, I love the healthy masculinity piece. I'm really passionate about that now. I just feel like it's a, it's a, let me back up. I got into this field because I felt like there was a war on sex in terms of all these sex negative messages coming from different places, be it society, media, religion. And I wanted to make sure that I wanted to be part of the positive message so that I was tackling in the best way I knew how with my skill set, the negative messages. That everybody has a birthright to pleasure. 
right? That that you know, and it's, it's it, not everybody lives in a country where they can access that birthright to pleasure, but certainly this country, hopefully, you know, we have a birthright to you know we have rights, we have individual rights, and, and a lot of that you know around our sexual health is what I have previously championed for. Now being a mother, I see all these other like places where um, sex and messages and gender and all these different like parts of our sexuality are also being challenged on like such interesting micro levels. And so I also want to just challenge some of those, you know, respectfully, but challenge what's happening and the evolution of different things. Um, Cause I want my boys to have, you know, I want my boys to have, it comes down to really my boys. It's like a selfish place. Cause like, that's what matters most. Um, but I want them to have, uh, I want, you know, as a mother, you want them to have everything, but I want them to have a really good, healthy understanding of their body and how to inhabit it and how to interact with this body, not just sexually, mm -hmm. but with other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just such a grave challenge in this society and technology and our phones and our screens and those are constantly evolving and it's like there's all these new di distractions and relationships to have. We have such relationships with our screens and it's like, it's hard to be a parent in this of like quick changing times and they want phones and they want to have the screens and you're like, it's just a tug of war and mm -hmm. what they see on the screens and we haven't talked about porn but like that's a whole nother component of like, how do you prepare them for that? If they're, that's inevitable. They're gonna see that, they're gonna see it sooner than I'd probably like them to see it inevitably for most kids and so how do you also prepare them for that so uh, I don't know if I answered your question <laughs> you certainly did okay <laughs> and, and I can definitely understand why you would choose to be passionate about healthy masculinity mm -hmm. married and two boys yeah so if there's not healthy masculinity in your in your tight-knit environment right then the next generation is going to be right. challenged and struggling right. just as we are today yeah I mean, you would think as a woman, what about healthy femininity? Um, and I want that too. Because yeah, that's attractive to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I feel like, uh, all right, I got that downloaded for the most part. And like, I don't really, as a mother of like two really young kids, I'm like, yeah, I'll do, I'll do me. Like I do enough self-care and like I, I do me, but like I'm much more focused on that. If I had two girls, I wouldn't be talking healthy masculinity probably. I'd be talking something really different. But I have two young boys. And, and I, we, we, we would have to teach our two young daughters how to recognize healthy masculinity. Yeah. Yeah. We need it all. Yeah. We need it so all. it's still centered around uh, what to recognize, what to see, what to notice. Yeah. Um, how to protect yourself against the opposite. Yeah. And both my kids will do jujitsu. One already does. Yeah. Like it's key. It is key. definitely the best choice I've ever made. And it brought us together too through, That's true. through Elliot and Easton. Yes. And uh, I still have yet to train with your husband. Oh okay. yeah. Well, uh, he's in Boulder. Yeah. I can make that trip. You can make the trip. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again. Yeah. I know pleasure. your time is valuable, so I won't take up much more of it. Oh, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah.